This is Larry Hopkins, and I'm here to share with you Lesson 70 in the historical books. Uh, this is Lesson 269 overall, and I'm thrilled to be with you here today. Larry, Larry, hold on, hold on. Hey, thanks for coming, but um, that was a really awfully humble greeting. Um, Kevin, some people who are familiar with Time to Revive, uh, most people would know who Larry is, but some people would know uh, how Larry's contributed to Time to Revive in a huge way. How, how is that? He helped, he did design the Tab Bible. Yeah. And so. brought it, he was just telling us about a prototype he just dug out when he was moving, so super encouraged by that. That, that project was, uh, was an inspiration by God, and um, I was wanting to share Christ with a friend uh, realized that I could not remember all the verses of the Roman road. And I thought, you know, if I didn't have tabs in my Bible already, uh, I could create tabs that opened up to the various scripture verses for the Roman road. And uh, I got to think, hey, that's not a bad idea. So uh, one thing led to another. Uh, but once again, I am, I'm pleased to be with you here today. Uh, my history with uh, Kyle Martin goes back a number of years. Uh, I was in a group here in Dallas called C12, and during that time, the Lord pressed upon me to pray for revival, specifically in Dallas, Texas, in the, in the uh, North Texas region. And so, for a period of about four months, every day at lunch, I would take off an hour, and I had a circuit of five churches that I would go to, and I would go and kneel in silence in prayer at those churches and pray for revival in uh, the Dallas area. Uh, one of the guys in my C12 group said, well, have you ever heard of Kyle Martin? And apparently this was not too, too long after the uh, Dallas tent revival. And I said, no. And uh, so I picked up the phone and called him and we went to have uh, lunch together and our breakfast, I don't remember which. Um, and uh, the rest is history, we've become good friend since then. And uh, when Kyle's out of town, I actually co-teach the uh, Friday morning Bible study in his absence. But today we're studying uh, the book of 2 Kings chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to pick up here in uh, verses 1 through 3, then we'll stop for a minute and talk about them. Uh, now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and mother, for he put away the sacred pillar of Baal, which his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. So we've mentioned some names here that we've talked about before, and I feel confident we're going to be talking about again here in the future, but I'd like to build a little genealogy here to kind of get us started. So the first name I've got uh, is Ahab. King of Israel. And I'm going to go ahead and insert in here using a different color his wife Jezebel. All right, Jezebel and Ahab have a son. Actually, they have two sons. The first one here is Ahaziah. Now, if you're from Indiana, you might pronounce that Ahaziah, but I pronounce it down in Texas, Ahaziah. So we've got Ahaziah. Hope y'all can read that. And then we have our main character in this story right now is Jehoram. So in order to tie these guys back into Scripture, uh, Kevin, can we go to uh, 1 Kings 16.30? Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So Ahab, as we're learning here, is also the son of Omri. 
All right. Next, uh, we'll read uh, quickly here in 1 Kings 22.51 about Ahaziah. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned two years over Israel. So we're building our genealogy. Uh, we now, though, have brought in the name of Jehoshaphat. Let's see if I can spell this. Is that close? A-T, but close. Okay. All right. Uh, and so Jehoshaphat is the king over Judah. Um, now I'd like to back up for one second and go to 1 Kings 11.26. What I'm going to show right here is that this line of uh, Israel and the kings of Israel stem back to Jeroboam, and that Jeroboam was, an, uh, Jeroboam was an Ephraimite. Then Jeroboam, son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zerah, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zerah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. So, um, I didn't really leave room here to insert Jeroboam, but I'm going to go ahead and stick him up here. And um, you're writing bigger than Kyle does. So. Thank you. So all of the kings of Israel are all descendants from Jeroboam. We've determined that Jeroboam was uh, from the tribe of Ephraim. So interesting note here, uh, Kevin. Let's let's just run over real quick to Jeremiah 31 9. Very interesting verse here. You know, if you recall back in the story in uh, Genesis uh, 48, where uh, Jacob was blessing the sons of Joseph, and he switched his hands over one another and ended up putting the blessing on the younger of the two, which was Ephraim. Um, and so Jeremiah 31, 9, With weeping they will come, and by supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of waters on a straight path, in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So I think that's an interesting note. And I, I think that when you look back at where we've been, when we were studying the book of Joshua, we had Caleb over here of the tribe of Judah, and then we had Joshua of the tribe of Ephraim. And so that's continuing on as we work through the kings here. We've got the kingdom of Judah. We've got the kingdom of Ephraim. And uh, I, just, I just paint that as a backdrop to kind of keep in the back of our mind. Uh, so let's move on here to uh, verses 4 and 5. Uh, now, Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder and used to pay the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So what we have here is... Uh, Moab actually uh, rebelled against Ahaziah, and Ahaziah just accepted it. He did not do anything to stop uh, Moab from ceasing paying the tribute. But uh, uh, Jehoram comes on the scene, and I guess he needs a new wool sweater for winter and has a hankering for a rack of lamb. He decides to go and uh, force the king of Moab, to continue paying the tribute. Um, so let's just move on here into uh, verses 6 through 9. And King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. Then he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go up with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, your people as my people, my horses as your horses. I think we've heard that before. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went and the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And they made a circuit of seven days journey 
And there was no water for the army or for the cattle that followed them. So if we look over here at the map, can you pull the map up? So apparently their route was from here down around the south end of the Dead Sea. And they're coming in to attack Moab across Edom. They're down this way down here. Now you would expect that Moab uh, would anticipate any invasion to come this way. So they're kind of uh, pulling a quick one on them here, coming around from the back. But what the kings did not take into consideration was availability of supplies and water for the troops. Uh, you know, I can just imagine, I, I'm, I'm getting dry mouth here just talking, uh, the thought of marching for seven days, and maybe the last couple of days you hadn't had any water, you're out. And you're expecting to cross some streams or someplace where you can get some water, and all of a sudden you're dry. And it's not like, uh, you know, the, the troops may have been close to a point of exhaustion, so they couldn't turn around and make it two days back or three days back, however far they had to go to get fresh water. So the kings get together and they try to take things into their own hands. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just kind of back up for a second and let's, let's take a look at this from the 30,000 foot elevation. Uh, what we have here are the three grandsons of Abraham all coming together to fight against Moab. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet by the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel's servants answered and said, Elisha the son of Shaphat is here, who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down. Now I can just hear uh, Jehoram saying at this point, but I hate him. You've heard that before. I hate him. He always speaks bad about me. Uh, but at the uh, word of Jehoshaphat, who insists, they go to see Elijah. Kind of been his pattern. Kind of been the pattern. Yep. Maybe we should inquire of the Lord. It's always, let's, let's take two steps forward. Oops, we're in trouble. Let's back up and inquire of the Lord. And so that's uh, kind of where they are. So when the king of Israel takes the position that, oh, we've been led into a trap. The Lord is leading us to deliver us into the hand of Moab. He's kind of one of those guys that just, uh, you know, when something bad goes wrong, they immediately default to the absolute worst case scenario. And it's, it's exhausting to be around people like that. But uh, King Josephat has a solution. Hey, let's go inquire the Lord and see what the Lord has to say about it. So we've talked about, is there not a prophet here that we may inquire? They go to seem. Let's go on to verse 12. Now, Elijah um, 13, let's back up. There we go. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down. 13. Now Elijah said to the king of Israel, What do I have to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. That, of course, is uh, King Ahab and Jezebel that he's referring to there. And the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to give them in the hand of Moab. Now, what I see happening here is uh, Jehoram kind of leaning over and putting his arm around Jehoshaphat because Jehoshaphat was, you know, uh, Elisha's man. He was a man after God and, and uh, was uh, favorable to the causes of God. And so now in 13, now Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do I have to do with you? Let's go on, I'm sorry, to 14. Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, were it not that I had regard for the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. So I think it's interesting. If you go to uh, Google and you do a Google search and you search for the worst king of Israel, 
you get pretty lively debate. It seems to be between Ahab and Jehu as which one was the worst. So if we could have a king meter, all right? So here's my king meter. And we're going to put David over here. He is a righteous king. He is a good king. And on the other hand, we're going to put Ahab and Jehu over on the opposite end of the spectrum. And then when we look at uh, Jehoram, he's kind of right here. He's not as bad as Ahab, but he's pretty bad. And we're going to look at Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat is not quite what King David was, but he's, he's over in this range somewhere. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the perspective. But I think it's interesting that Ahab comes on the scene, a very evil king, and God sends Elijah to kind of be a voice of reason. You know, I kind of think of it as my wife. You know, sometimes I come up with some wild and crazy ideas and she's there to kind of rein me in and keep me on track. And, and I feel like Elijah kind of provided that same type of buffer uh, for Ahab. And uh, Ahab is passed off the scene. Uh, Jeho Jehoram is now king over Israel. And now we have Elisha that's taken the, the, his position. And so um, he is the buffer that's going to kind of help rein things in and hopefully keep our kings on track. But he doesn't sound like he has a whole lot. He doesn't really want to talk to Jehoram. I don't think he does. I don't think he does. In fact, I think Elisha is in a very bad mood. I'm not sure that he's completely over being called baldy. All right, he's still a little bit upset about that. And hey, I got to admit, if you notice here, you know, and it doesn't bother me. I can't see the back of my head. But every now and then somebody will say something about it. And, you know, for a day, I'm kind of conscious about it. I don't have any hair back here. But so anyway, I think Elijah might have been a little bit sore about that because he does kind of snap at Jehoram. Uh, but in, in uh, verse 15, if we can go there. But now bring me a minstrel and let it come about when the minstrel is played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Uh, you know, my first thought when I read this, I, I, what comes to mind is King David playing the harp for King Saul. Actually, David was not king at the time, but he still, he played that harp for Saul, and it seemed to calm his spirit. The evil spirit departed from him. Uh, Kevin, if we could go to 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 18. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Saul's servants and said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you. Notice it is the evil spirit from God, that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me now for a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. And now if you'd skip down to verse 23, 1 Samuel 16. So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take up his harp and play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. So what I conclude from that is that there is some connection between music, the playing of music, uh, a, a uh, melody that's uh, easy on the ear, that somehow can affect the spirits. And so... I'd like to skip over right now to a, to a commentary, and this is a very interesting commentary. I don't know anything about this uh, author, uh, but what it's quoting back to is uh, somebody by the name of Ephraim the Syrian, who lived in the 4th century A.D. And so this is a quote, uh, an instrument to assert God's power. The scripture mentions a musical instrument that produces sounds, or a harp, as the Hebrew says, 
so that thanks to the sound of the music, all the soldiers might be assembled around it and might understand then they were summoned to destroy their enemies and there might be evident testimonies of Elijah's words. In this way, when the miracle occurred, they could not attribute it to Baal or the idols they worshipped. Indeed, there were numerous idolaters in the army. So we're bringing in the fact that we have this musical instrument. It has inspired, if you will, Elisha to uh, give this proclamation. And here's what he says in verse 16. He said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of trenches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water so that you shall drink, you and your cattle and your beasts. But uh, this is but a slight thing in the sight of the Lord. And oh, by the way, he will also give the Moabites into your hand. So not only is he going to uh, fulfill their immediate need, and that is the need to have water to quench their thirst, but he's also saying God is going to go one step further, and he's going to give the Moabites into your hand. So Elisha continues on and gives us some more instructions. Then you shall strike every fortified city and every choice city, and fell every good tree, and stop all the springs of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. It happened in the morning, about the time of the offering and sacrifice, that behold, water came by way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. So I want to go back to my uh, commentary again by Ephraim the Syrian. And uh, he says this, uh, a type of the conversion of the Gentiles is the parallel he's drawing here. The harp is played, and the water flowed to the bed of the streams. Through this figure, the voice of Christ is conveniently foreshadowed, because he kept the harp of the Spirit on the cross. Indeed, our Lord cried twice and gave up his Spirit with a loud voice, and immediately the pagan centurion gave glory to the Lord. And in this manner, the conversion of the Gentiles was clearly highlighted. After the Christ had brought to perfection on the wood cross the new glory of our Savior, the resources were immediately opened, and rivers of living water flowed on the nations of the Gentiles who were symbolized by the wadi or the valley described here in 2 Kings. Let the one who believes in me drink, as the Scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. In this way, the word of the prophet might be fulfilled. He who has played the harp will play for the Gentiles in the name of the Lord. So that's just tying. I mean, this, this seriously, we don't know how severe this drought was for the armies, but it is possible that this could have been uh, a literal salvation here for them. I mean, they could have been facing death otherwise without this intervention by Elisha and by God. Let's pick up again 21. Now the Moabites heard that the kings had come to fight against them, and all who were able to put on armor and older were summoned and stood on the border. They rose early in the morning, and the sun shone on the water, and the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. And they said, This is the blood. The kings have surely fought together, and they have slain one another. Now, therefore, Moab, to the spoil. All right, let's picture this. You're a young kid. you got heavy armor on. You've got a shield. you got a sword. you got all this stuff. And your superiors say, There is no battle. Go to the spoil. What's the first thing? You're going to take off your armor. You're going to take off your mail. You're going to drop everything you're going to run over to collect the spoil. And so I believe that's what's happened here. They go over unarmed, and they look up and they find themselves in the Israelites in the uh, camp of Judah. So in verse 23, go to 24 now. But when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites arose and struck the Moabites so that they fled before them. 
and they went forward into the land, slaughtering the Moabites. Thus they destroyed the cities, and each one threw a stone on every piece of good land and filled it. So they stopped all the springs of water and felled all the good trees until Ker Hashereth only left its stones. However, the slingers went about it and struck it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not. Now, I'm not sure exactly why he was trying to break through to the king of Edom. Um, I kind of maybe gather that the king of Edom was somewhat neutral in this battle. They were neighbors directly next door uh, to the Moabites, and uh, there might have been a refuge there. But nonetheless, the king of Moab is trying to break through. Now, what I vision here is that the Moabites are probably generally peace-loving people. I mean, you don't think of guys out herding 100,000 sheep as being valiant warriors that are out trying to pick fights with their neighbors. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, he who lives in glass houses shall not cast stones. I mean, uh, your livelihood is pretty easy to destroy or disperse or uh, uh, be poisoned or whatever. So I get the feeling that these Moabites were we're pretty much peace-loving people. And so when we go to 27, uh, this is just a very strange ending to this story. The king of Moab, he took his eldest son who was to reign in his place, and he offered him as a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. So I think, once again, that the king of Moab is saying, look, we're, we're, we're peaceful people, all right? I mean, we don't want to be giving you 100,000 lambs and 100,000 uh, coats of wool every year. We just want you to leave us alone, let us live our lives. And uh, I, I think that that was why there was such disgust. I think that the king of uh, Judah probably looked at this and goes, what are you, what are you guys doing? I mean, let's, let's leave these guys alone. Let's turn around and go home. And so uh, that's exactly what happened. And so as we wrap up this book or this uh, particular chapter, I want to thank you for the opportunity of letting me come and share with you. Uh, I'm going to be back with you in a couple of days uh, working through 2 Kings chapter 7 and 8. I look forward to that. And... Um, I think that we're going to be moving, obviously, tomorrow into 2 Kings, uh, chapters 4, what, 4, just chapter 4. So thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you.